podcast like this. Who gon' bring it to the table? Boss talk. Who your girlfriend favorite? Boss talk. We gon' do it how you want it. Boss talk. Yeah, everybody on it. Boss talk. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. This is Unique House. This is your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Not, not you know my dad walk on. Man, we got a guy here today, y'all, straight out of Bompton, <laughs> get right, California. Get right. That boy's in the building, man. I told her. Ayatollah Marv is in the building. Let me say the name right, man. Yeah, hey, man, this guy here been supporting us, man, for a long time. Ever since we've been doing this show, man, I went up to L.A., man. I got to meet this guy. I'll never forget it, man. And, uh, yeah, he family. So he in the building. What's going on, my brother? Man, everything. We we working hard, keeping it keeping it moving, trying to make sure uh, we keep everything regulated. Man, so man, I, I man, I've been seeing a lot of things, man. So when I when when you said that, hey man, I'm gonna be in Texas, I was like, man, we gotta rock out. That's right. I wanted to ask you about uh different things that have been going on, you know, here lately, man. I couldn't believe that uh 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 what had happened up there at uh the same Roscoe's that I usually sometimes go to, uh P and B Rock, the the dude that uh basically was inside of there. They at first said that it was something that was uh, related to gangs and all, you know. And thought, but when you, when you see stuff happen like that, what do you uh, what do you what do you think about it? You know, because you guys been seeing this forever though in in L.A. Like where where things get cut, kind of, and it's not just in L.A. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. I it's mean, everywhere. It's it's, it's 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 the policy what you talk about. It, checking in, checking in is a courtesy. Uh, wherever you go, I just left Chicago. I checked in with the Nation of Islam. I checked in with, because I don't know the temperature of Chicago. I don't want to be in the wrong place at the right time and be a, have a tag on my toe. Mm-hmm. I've been to 40 states of the United States keeping the crime rate up, and I checked in because I, I don't know what your town is doing. That's a courtesy. And when you get, and n- nobody ever had a problem with checking in before a white boy, Takashi 69 said he wasn't checking in. And then niggas went crazy about checking in. If a white man don't say it, Negroes act like, you know. So it's, see, there, there, you have to understand the difference between checking in and being taxed. See, you can get taxed. I can come to, come to uh, Dallas, come to Fort Worth, and you say, uh, check this out, I told him. It costs you a uh, five thousand to run our track. You know we gotta we gotta do this, and either I gotta pay it, or I don't pay. You understand me? Pay a fight. Then you, you, some people call it paying rent to come in your state because this is how you run your razor. Now as a common courtesy, I say, well, hey, uh, E, I'm coming to Dallas. Wait, right now, don't don't come down uh, Elam because uh, traffic kind of heavy down here. Take the back road. So that's the courtesy of checking in. It's nothing wrong with checking in. People talk about this not checking in. This, when you understand what your boundaries are, when you come to California, if you ain't checking in, stay your ass north of Wilshire, because the gangbangers ain't coming north of Wilshire. Mm-hmm. Or stay in Disneyland, where the lames be in Disneyland. Or stay in the valley with the valley girls. That's what, if you come in the jungle, be ready to get eaten up by the tiger. Wow. Yeah. PMB could have been anywhere. He could have went to Roscoe's on Manchester, Los Angeles. He could have went to Roscoe's in Hollywood. He could have went to Roscoe's in Long Beach. He could have went to the Roscoe's in, in Disneyland. But his destiny took him there because he didn't check in. Wow. You know? Yeah, yeah. So if he'd have checked in, it, it- somebody would have told him. Dude, okay, cuz of blood. You going you going we'll we'll have somebody to meet you on Manchester in Maine. Because it's security, it's things everybody um just like this this brother uh with the Migos that just got killed. Take off. Take off got if you understand the dynamics, there uh the um management group he was with was called quality control. Yeah. Quality control with with uh, Coach K and P uh, Pierre, they broke off from they uh, they didn't they didn't need quality control no more, and they went to Texas. 
So their security blanket was gone, right? The protection wasn't there no more. Probably Coach K would have called somebody in Texas, hey, man, my boys is coming down. That's what kept them before. So when you think you're bigger than the organization, these kind of fatalities can happen. So we got to always remember that, man, this is bigger than just you. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, even when when Biggie got killed, when Biggie got killed, Puffy had two po- LAPD securing him and his security. But Biggie didn't have no security on. Huh? Wow. That's crazy. You and, know? And, and because you would think it'd be vice versa. You, you, would, you think it'd be vice versa, but sometimes you, it's casualties of war. Wow. A- after Biggie, Puffy didn't go down. He went all the way up. He did. Now, he did. when Pac got killed, it was something in-house. And Pac, the two people that Pac, let me not say cared, trusted the most, Frank and Thomas, they both dead. So now, Pac didn't care nothing about the police, didn't deal with them at all. So was he a casualty of this crime? Or was he wanted to well get rid of him? And after he died, Suge never got any better. He didn't go up. He went all the way down. <laughs> so it wasn't behooving him. But the same people that was involved in all this is one man that's with them. Reggie was there when Pac got killed. Reggie was there when Biggie got killed. He was there when Buntry got killed. And I know for a fact. I know for a fact that Poochie didn't kill uh, Biggie Small. Wow. And he didn't kill Buncherel. So where, where are they getting these stories? If I mean, the police will every real believe any story, but it's hard to believe the truth, huh? Yeah, yeah. You know, That's- if you keep on saying it over and over and over, it's just like, these dudes that talk about Big Hugh. I don't know Big Hugh from a can of paint. We ain't never, never met Big I, Hugh. Never met him. He's in L.A. I'm in Compton. I got some business. I have. But this dude has done something for the community. He took 100 boys and put suits on them and changed their lives. And it's two uh, Yosemite Sam and Charlie. They talk about he's on grid and he's this and he's that and he's a snitch. But none of his homeboys said he's snitch. Do you know what... The dude that killed um, Nipsey, if he had told the police that he was hired to kill him by uh, Big Hugh, what kind of deal he would have got? Real talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you, you've heard you've heard insinuations of so, different yeah, things. But these same tattletales that's talking about what Big Hugh character, Big Hugh just don't know how to orientate himself. He's a doer. He's not a talker. He's not a conversal kind of guy. If you listen to it, he's not a public speaker. Yeah. But he's a doer. And ain't nobody in his hood ever said, you can't get nobody to say, oh, he works for grid. Who he told on? Yeah. But you dudes is getting on podcasts talking about where you work. So sound like a Balachi theory to me, and you keep on saying it, keep on saying it, people believe it, huh? Yeah, yeah. I always, anytime I reach out to him, um, I always respect, I always try to help, you know, far as through the people that I know to link with him. Yeah. So I never. So just that's on, on that good, element. Good vibes, right? Yeah. On that element, I just say that people, it's a gang of stuff that people say about you. Don't make it true. Mm-hmm. And things that you do. Uh, Vlad TV, they talk about him too, though. They say he exploiting the people. That white man, yeah. he is. Yeah. And every white man do. Dang. Which one don't? He just he exploit black people. Yeah. He don't have no Asians on there. Mm-hmm. He don't have no Mexicans on there. He got these coons jumping up and down, doing interviews for free for fifteen seconds of glory, and he's getting paid. Mm. It's another form of slavery. I mean, we're still doing it. Yeah, but I'd rather be slave with you than with a cracker. I ain't gonna do it for like that. You so know? you never you 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 don't you don't mess with him. No, not if he ain't paying me. Yeah, yeah. I'm a paid slave. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, still a slave. You know, it's just like, you know, we, you got your boy Charlie. He talks about how this is happening. Y'all gonna talk about Jerry Jones. Right. Your owner of the, the Dallas Cowboys. He was at the Ku Klux Klan meeting, not letting blacks in school, but he had a change of heart. Did he, or did he have a change of heart? <laughs> oh, he don't have any blacks in the upper echelon of his, of his establishment. So he got the same racist mentality he did when he stood up in high school and not wanting blacks to come in their high school. Wow. Oh, I was young, and I mean, so R. Kelly was young too. So like everybody was young, but whatever. When when Kanye West says something that Negroes, it gets over our head. We take things that are emotional. Uh, Kanye said slavery is a choice. Well, he didn't say the slaves that came here had a choice. But when you take a million dollars and this cracker tell you what to do, you have a choice to say yes or no, huh? So slavery is a choice. Yeah. So he talking about pretense. So whatever it is now that he's tried to be a free Passing. slave, they start be mangling him, huh? putting him in his place. Kyrie Irving made a statement about a movie, but they never said a thing about Amazon that put the movie out. huh? You're right. I never heard. I, I never heard them say. They said after the, after the interview with Kyrie Irving, they their sales went up seventy five percent. But did they donate it to the blacks in America? Mm -mm. But we look at the little picture. We don't look at the big picture. Wow. It's easy for us to say what our children are doing. We're the only race on the planet that criticize our children. You don't hear Mexicans criticizing their kids. You don't hear Japs criticizing their children. Let them grow. Even a white man, he ain't going to criticize. If I mean, I was going to high school. I was going to Gardena High School. I was predominantly white. If a white boy hung out with us, his parents would disown him. You don't want to be a nigga, you just act like the niggas and come back at 21 and be white again. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But we embrace everybody but each other. They don't invite us to Cinco de Mayo. And when you come, they start speaking Spanish. So you don't know what you're talking about. Wow. But when we have Black History Month, we want everybody in there. huh? Let me ask you something. Like when you look at like, like you brought up a valid point. I've been watching it like, like everybody you see is affiliating themselves with some kind of way. Like, like we talked about Chris Brown that time. It, it, when we talked about Chris Brown, everybody was listening and looking. And, but Chris Brown ain't the only one that was doing, you know, that, that represents. The, and I the, just, you at, at that time, I used Chris's name because Chris, he did for Compton as much as Compton asked. Ask for nothing, you get nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. You dig what I'm saying? He never violated. You know what I'm saying? So his name just came because he was from Fruit Town and this and that. But, other people exploit your hood. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And it's not that we we exploit each other. You're if, right. it, if, 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 it, if it was a, a white man, come on, we'll pay him a million dollars. When I ask you to do something, I want you to do it for free. free. Yeah, that's right. Uh, Steve Harvey, and I don't even like Steve Harvey. You know, uh, you know he's a coon. To, uh, he's a selfish, self-centered person, but he said something one day that made so much. He said, if you're my friend, why should I give you a ticket? You should support me buy a ticket. Yeah. If right. we're friends. Hey, uh, e, can you get me in for free? <laughs> what friendship? If I like what you're doing, I'm going to pay to come. But I'm not going to ask you to, hey, man, can you send me a ticket to come to Dallas? No, I. If I need to come here, I'm gonna come. Oh, yeah. Because I feel like you're a friend. Exactly. And and, and if I needed something, I could ask you. Definitely you. can. That's you dig what I'm saying? Yeah, that's I, real, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's just the things that we do amongst each other are so negative, and we don't look at the picture. We always talk about the problem. We never talk about the solution. I want to go back to uh, Steve Harvey. Why you don't like Steve Harvey? I was, I was in California when he came to California, 
and he embraced the nation of Islam. And he and then the nation of Islam, being naive, we're well not being naive, introduced him to Dale Dog Dim and the Main Street Crips, and he said, "I don't need you niggas no more." Wow, you did what I'm saying. Mm-hmm. So only for a season. So yeah. So even though his bodyguard is the one that wrote the first book. And he was so jealous of, I can't even think of brother's name. He wrote this book and they were going uh, to different tours and he was aut- signing autographs and Steve became so jealous. He wrote, he wrote a book just like it. Wow. <laughs> think like a man, act like a woman. Yeah, think, think like, like a, a man. Yeah. He got that from his bodyguard. What? Nothing, he's so jealous. Je- nephew Tommy is talented. Yeah. Steve is not. His jokes are whack. Everything he do is dumb. He was so dumb one time. We, he was at the Hollywood at the Forum, and they it was the Kings of Comedy. And when he came on, his jokes was so whack. Dude, like man, shut up! Th- threw a Hennessy bottle at him, mm. and he said, oh, "Man, I don't care whether you like my me or not. I got a Rolex watch. Y'all paid for this to get in, there. and yeah, you paid to get in here." Wow. So, you know, that's my personal. He rich, I ain't. You know what I'm <laughs> so he don't care whether I like him or not. Exactly. You know, so it, it, it ain't important to him. <laughs> you, know? well, it, well, you, you mentioned that uh, you say uh, Charleston. Uh, so he was in California. Yeah, he, he came to California and, and uh, he claimed that uh, some guy interviewed him, wanted to pay him $30,000. So uh, with the temperature where it was, he came in and and he got taxed. He came to California, got a security team, some Mexicans and some other whoever they was, and he stayed his ass in Anaheim. He didn't come to the hood. And uh, he paid him $10,000 to come to California. That's being taxed. If he was a legitimate dude, he could have checked in with somebody. Wow. For free. Wow. So I, you know, I, I've been in, I've been in hiding because I had a contract on me, <laughs> and, and, and Yosemite Sam, he, he was gonna kill me, uh, uh, pretended to, and I, I got so many letters from prison and and some real legitimate homies, you know. But I just had, left, man, it's all entertainment. You it's know? all entertainment. So, <laughs> so when you when you look at at what the. Uh, the masses are 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 projecting the, our people as when you look at the way that the internet portrays us because it is what it is. You know what I mean? We're still jesters and coons <laughs> compared to before there was the, you know the internet the internet wave. You look at how you felt about the people then, and you look at now. Uh, is it the thing that does it seem to be the same as it was then? Well, I'm gonna tell you what I'm I, I'm gonna tell you what Melvin Farmer say. I don't even watch that stuff. I don't know. I want to keep everything pure. I, I'm not. I'm not on the internet. You know, I I got more things to do Dude, in my and, life. I, I got children to take care of. Yeah. I got homes. I got you know, and keeping the crime rate. It's a full time job. Yeah. Uh, I I don't I don't play video games and I don't watch the media. Yeah. I'm yeah. a real grown man. No, and that's and that's and that's live, man. So, no. I mean, when I look at, like I said, you you being in California, man, the way they portray the the the, the gangs and the way that they look at it as if, you know, it started off a good thing the way it was helping the community. That it's it never was the gangs it never helped the community. That's a that, lie. Well, that, is that that's what a they narrative. Say? So that, okay, so that's if, if that, you, that's something to talk about, right? Let's if talk you about ask that. about the gangs when they started in sixty nine seventy. How many white folks, how many times in Hollywood did they disrupt? When they started gang, before, during Christmas time, about this time on uh, 92nd and Avalon, between Avalon and Central, they had an array of every house had Christmas declarations on it. And it was just amazing. And p- mothers would walk their children up and down the street to see these uh, different ornaments. When gangs started, they start terrorizing the people's houses, breaking the the ornaments, stealing light bulbs, and they ended Christmas. Wow! Not that Christmas is great, but it's a foundation for families to go on, whether you believe in it or not. 
You know, it's something that the black community that cherished. We had Watt Stacks. We had the Watt Summer Festival. All that was eliminated through gang activity. So what good did they do to the community? What was they protecting? They were still in leather coats. Then they started still in T-shirts. They could have took the same leather coat from Sears or Macy's, but they took it off another kid that his mother had to work for. It. So what good did the gang do the community? I hear the line. Yeah, they, we started protecting. Them. Who did you protect? You didn't kill no police. How many police murders through gangs have you in California? Add it up. I'll wait. So, no, it was not to protect the community. It was uh, an assassination of the community. And we haven't vibrated back from that yet. Mm -hmm. You know, it's still Compton is in the worst condition now today in 2022 than it was in 1970. We had black businesses. Today, you cannot go to Compton and get go to a black restaurant. You cannot go to a black store. It's nothing in Compton. We'll have every major city has a main street named Martin Luther King, but Compton, the first mm -hmm. black city west of the Mississippi's. Well, how can we make a change? Kill everybody and start over again. How can we make a, um, because that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. So we're in a position now. So you say it will never change. It will never change. You know, it's not, we will never change. Uh, in Islam, it says that God will never change a man until he changes his own heart. Mm -hmm. And until we change the heart of the people. And it says, if the generation does not change, Allah will destroy that whole generation and make a new one. Mm-hmm. So our end game is over. It's on how you can save yourself. Uh, you know, uh, uh, um, um, the, the famous gangster Al Capone said one time at a meeting, he says, life is like baseball. When you get up to hit, if you hit a home run, it's good for the team. But if, it's, if you strike out, it's just you. Mm -hmm, that's true. You know what I'm saying? So we, we've come into baseball right now. It's what you can do for yourself and how you can make a change. Like Pac said, it don't take but one. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Takashi 6 9 earlier. Did you know that him and Wack 100 are friends? Yeah. They run together. Yeah. Birds of snitches of a feather run together. Mm. I was just, because I, I, I'd, I'd heard, I, I know, I remember, I said, man, I. I know they used to run together. Or they, he mentioned the other day when I was watching something that that was his, that Takashi said that, that he was a, a friend of his. Yeah, you know, they, they worked together and he, he defended it. I mean, but are you saying earlier, 90% of every, a man said one time, we, we, we was on the county jail bus going to court, and uh, this, this guy that's supposed to have been crazy, he get on the bus and everybody was heckling him. Crazy, oh, whoa, whoa, blood, this blood, that, whoa, whoa, whoa. Dude turned around and said, wait a minute. You say I'm crazy. He said, and you said I'm snitching. He said, but every one of y'all on this bus is snitches. What snitch? He said, when you tell the police your name, you if you tell on you, you'll tell on anybody, huh? <laughs> he said, look at this wristband. He said, my name is John Doe. I made him give me a name. Mm. Wow. I didn't tell him nothing. Wow. Because I, they tell you when they arrest you, you have a right, right to, to remain, remain silent. silent. Anything you say can and will be held against you. And we start talking. We start talking every time. Well, see, no, it didn't happen like this. Uh, see, me and Fred was together, and Fred, uh, Fred, who was Fred? Fred, Fred, his mama stay over here, and we was all over here, and we did the, the, the RICO Act. We just talking about the RICO Act earlier. The RICO Act is a conglomerate of continued criminal experience, not just because you're there. They have to monitor that you and you and me conspired on an ongoing criminal investigation. Just because you're standing there, don't make it that ain't gonna be enough. Rico. No, it doesn't. 
And in the in the feds, when you take if if all of us are busted together and y'all get 20 years and I get five, I told on you. Mm. Everybody dudes be told me, man, so and so snitched on me. When you take a deal, you snitched on yourself. So you're going to kill you. you These dudes the that took a deal in the feds. When you take a deal, it's called an accepting responsibility. So I have to tell the judge every element of the crime. When I got to the door, Queen opened the door. Boss Talk was interviewing a guy here, and this lady was sitting over here. You have to tell every element of the crime to get your deal. You just can't. In the state, you can just say, I'm guilty. Mm -hmm. In the feds, you have to accept responsibility. Wow. And when you accept the responsibility, I got to tell on you, you, and you. What was the question you was asking about, Gunner? What did what it? Cause she asking this question, so she got to get that out. Um, no, it's just that. Do you think he? Um, let me see. No jumper said something yeah. about it. Um, what do you think about Gunner snitching to get out of jail? Because it was Gunner and Young Thug went in together. They've been locked mm-hmm. up the whole time together on the RICO charge. Because he signed now paperwork. Now he got out today. He signed Who paperwork. Was Gunner? Gunner is the one that was with. Young thug down in Atlanta when when they when them boys they got from Compton. No, they, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they got. If one gets released, what does that mean? He just said it earlier. Yeah, but that what he was saying. If one get five, another get ten. But okay. if you get locked up with somebody and y'all both got locked up on a RICO charge, they got y'all together. Now all of a sudden, one gets out. And the other one still yeah, because up. when I look at comments of what people are saying, they're saying that Gunner was supposed to have his case next March, and all of a sudden now he released, he released and, from jail. You know, so they're like they just look so fishy, really. It, it is fishy. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, if we if we all get busted together, <laughs> and amazingly that Jesus just slides me out. <laughs> He slid me out for a purpose, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I mean, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know the case. I don't know anything. I can't speak on it intelligently. Yeah, yeah. So I don't want to speculate on what nobody is in or out. But ninety percent of everybody is snitching. Ninety percent. Ninety percent. See, he got the same analogy. Ninety percent. Mm-hmm. They got. They get. They getting it in. It, 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 we talking, especially with blacks. We talking. Wow, I seen you on a picture with uh, Sauce Walker uh, when you when when he was up there when he went through his thing. I just give me a breakdown of how that even how that even happens. Man, uh, I was I was working uh, in in the pop shops uh, in my business pop, Pots Grove Farms, and uh, brother came through, and uh, he's like he popped up like oh oh gee, I didn't know I didn't know who he was. You know, I didn't. so he told me it was Sauce Walker, and he was out of out of out of Houston, and we uh, took a couple of pictures together, and found out that we knew some of the same people back when I was back there in in the seventies. In the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So so, so that's, that's a good link because he's a real like he's a real. Prominent entrepreneur and and like I heard. oh he's yeah. he's he's one of those guys yeah, when it come a, down I, to Texas oh yeah he, I just did a a, a a podcast Melvin set us up with a podcast with some some little brothers out of uh, Houston did a we did a real good interview uh, well they did they took some stuff that I had said about um, Minister Farrakhan uh, Honor Elijah Muhammad Malcolm X and Khalid Muhammad okay you know? so. Real good information. I think it was. It was my information. Like, well, yours is. I mean, it's one hundred. It, it was legitimate. I mean, was, from what I know. Yeah, yeah. Know? So yeah. So, yeah. okay. So, so basically, I, I mean, you've been you've been killing the game. When I look on the internet, I could I could find you uh, on on here, man. And you see. So when you when you was in prison, man, let's go back to that for a second, because you hadn't been locked up now for a long time, right? Man, since I've been by uh, the grace of God, I've been home uh, since uh, 1995. I went to the feds for a year on a failure to communicate, and after that, I've been I've been out 
about 26 years. And that's the part what I think people don't understand. You've been out for 26 years. You out here maintaining, you know what I mean? Um, I think that's something to applaud. You know what I mean? Because you, before that, you was, were you in and out before that? Mm hmm. And, and, and so what made you, what made you get it right? How did you get it right? I think that would be something people would want to know. I mean, uh, I got it. What it, it wasn't that I got it right. I just when you get tired of being tired, you know, it. Your mother. It's about you know your your, your people can pray for you, and I can say that I'm gonna get it right. And like I can say before, God say you'll never change a man until he changes his own heart. Yeah. And um, when I got to prison, when I first came to prison from Youth Authority, I was young Marv. I was a youngster putting it in. And by 95, I was old dude and pops. <laughs> now, I'm in prison with dudes that I was in their sons and their grandsons. Wow. And I found out that I had outgrew prison. You feel mm, what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I had an incident one time when I... You know, when I grew up, it was from the first grade to the sixth grade was elementary. Yeah. Then you went to junior high school. Yeah, yeah, then yeah. You went that's to high it. School. That's so it. When you, when you was in the sixth grade, you was the boss of the school. That's right. So uh, one day, I, we were getting ready to go to recess, and I snatched the ball. And my teacher told me, Marvin, put that ball. I wanted the ball first. I'm no, I'm rumbling for it. He takes me to the principal office. I go to the principal office. Mr. Thomas said, Marvin, what's your problem? I'm pouting. He said, well, man, since you want to act like a third grader, I'm going to put you in the third grade. <laughs> and he sent me over to Miss Holmes' class in the third grade. So when I sat down, my knees was touching the punch. I was too big, <laughs> right? And if you talking, Miss Holmes would hit you with a ruler. And I got, I was going home, and all the kids were telling hey, your brother's in the third grade. Like, and it was just a, a torturing week of me. I man, I'm out of place here. Man. So after 25 years in prison, my knees start touching the bench. Wow. And it was time to go. You know. That's hard. Uh, uh, a man told me one time, uh, one of the first black business owners of uh, Compton on on the main stone Compton Boulevard, named uh, Ronald Exum. Uh, he had Exum Styles back in the 60s, well, 69, 68, 69. Then he got a clothing store like y'all's clothes. But he was the first black entrepreneur on Compton Boulevard wow. before White Flight, right? And he told me, he said, man, you going in. I was about 15. He told me, you going in out of juvenile. Man, you go in there, you need to learn a trade. Get you something that you have to do something for. Because if you ain't made it by the time you're 40, you need to shoot yourself in the head. I couldn't imagine that at 15, right? And it came to pass that my sister had gotten killed mm. in 1982. And the guy that was accused, his brother was in the same prison with me. And... Me and my crew was getting ready to go handle that little bit of business. And a brother that was in the Nation of Islam was from the 60s. Brother Yusuf said, hey, wait, brother, Mar, man, hold up, bro. We got enough. He said, why don't you do Ramadan with us? Mm. So he said, man, you know, if you want to kill him today, you can kill him in 30 days. Makes sense to me. So he just going to, nowhere. So, so this is the spot. I, I went in, did the Ramadan. And I'm doing Ramadan. And listen, the Nation of Islam and the Bahrainians is a new Muslim. Um, and we didn't have nothing to do with them. We used to call them Abadabas and soft Muslims still smoking cigarettes and eating hog and doing five prayers a day. And you got no discipline, right? So I went in there. But it's every day we do a 30th of the Quran. And we're reading the Quran. And in Surah 62, it says that. A woman suckles a child for 36 months, and a man achieves manhood at age 40. So the same thing you did at 20, you don't do at 40. You start looking both ways. Huh? Your thing ain't as quick as it was when you were 17, 18. You ain't popping it like you was. So if you're in prison at 40, 
what the hell are you going home for? Uh. In San Quentin, they got what calls Citizens Row, West Block. Everybody over 25, 30 years, the old men is over there. Old men for council, young men for war. Mm. And Chino is Elm Hall. All the handicaps and the old people. Dudes like Bob Wells, he was at the time I was in prison, he did one of the longest times he did, 42 years. And he used to have a cane and be cussing like a sailor, right? But So I'm just saying, when you get to a certain point in your life, you start living a different life if you're a man of any virtue. Some people try to live their 16-year-olds as, as they 60, you know. Right. People, man, Ma, why are you trying to act young? I don't act young. I just be down with who I am. Yeah. I wanted to uh, ask you, I seen somewhere where you um, you knew Aaliyah's uncle. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I work, Black, Black Ground Records. I worked for Barry Hankins, and I worked for Black Ground Records. And you, when when Aaliyah died, you was with the uncle, or you? Was yeah, I was around? with him. Yeah. How, explain to me how that how that was. When he when he got the when uh, after Aaliyah passed, and the uh, the insurance uh, paid the uh, uh, insurance policy, and uh, so I was doing a personal with Barry at the time. Okay. So I was his personal security when he. Uh, Got the uh, uh, got the settlement, and uh, he kicked back. And his her, her mother had got a settlement too. She was, I think, she was in New York, or I think she was in New York at the time, you know. So he uh, uh, got about ninety million dollars for her death. Wow, you know, for royalties and stuff like that. Wow. So yeah. Yeah, and and it it had, but it, but it still was just it just had to be tough on because that was so sudden. I remember when that plane. It, I guess they said it was over the load overloaded, was overloaded, yeah. and yeah. and it caused that plane to go down. Right, it didn't even hardly make it away from where they were, you know, where they was at. Right, yeah. It was, I don't remember what I know. They was out of the country. It was mm-hmm. in, the, in, the, uh, in the Bahamas. Bahamas. In yeah. The Bahamas, yeah. yeah. Man, that was, and she had such a bright future. But she did more than a lot of people ever do in a lifetime, even when the time she was here. Yeah, she was amazing. She was amazing. Girl. She did movies. She did all mm-hmm. kind of stuff. I'm mm-hmm. a big fan. I love to go back and see her movies, you know, like mm-hmm. when they come on. Yeah. I'll I was, watch we, them. We, we, uh, we were at the Hotel Nico when Biggie them came. When I was with her the night that Biggie got killed. Really? Uh, yeah, we were supposed to be going to the Peterson Hotel, over to the Peterson Museum. And... uh she was upstairs getting dressed. Uh, Genuine and um, Missy was in the um, was was in the limo, and I went up to get her. And Captain Shahid called and told me, "Man, don't come over here. Biggie just got shot." Wow. You know, and we had just saw him early, and it, it, the atmosphere was like, "Man, do not come to Cali. Do not come." And when we saw him pull, he pulled up about two o'clock. Jumped out of the, the limo, him and Puffy, and jumped out the limo. He had on a, a white walking suit and a, a white mink coat. He jumped out smiling. Captain Shahid walked up to Captain Shahid, uh, the captain of the West Coast uh, of the Nation of Islam. Mm-hmm. And uh, Cap walked up and asked uh, Biggie, hey, Biggie, you need any help? Biggie told him, and these two uh, detectives, L.A. detectives like Shahid Muhammad, yeah, well, we got this. You know, uh, don't worry about it. But if you look at it, Russell Simmons, Biggie, Spike Lee, uh, Death Row Records, as long as the Nation of Islam was on detail, we didn't lose one. Wow. When they thought they were bigger than the nation, they start falling off. Wow. I was with Pac when he was doing gridlock. And... Uh, 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 should brought in Reggie and his crew, and not two months later, she, he was dead. Mm. Wow, that's crazy. I see where where you uh was fighting the Crips to protect Brandy and Ray J. Is that a real thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, that's that's a, that's how we started. Out. That's how I started off. With, that's how I got my first job. We were down at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffle on okay. La Brea, and uh, 
uh, Pico and La Brea, and uh, the Manfield Crips was pushing up on Brandy them, and they came in like, hey, man, these dudes in there uh, messing with uh, with Brandy. And we go inside and go outside. It's like four or five of us and all these little dudes, and we squabbling. This dude, Hakeem, like, man, we working for $5.50 <laughs> an hour. He said, man, you want a real job? He said, man, you know Shahid, mom? I'm like, yeah. He said, well, call Cap. He called Shahid. Next thing I know, I was doing set it off. But how did you How did you even know that was Brandy and Ray, and Ray J? How did they you come know? In every weekend. So, And they just decided to press him? Why would they press him? Paying rent. You and I hood. Oh, hood. That's the hood. Mm -hmm. and, and so y'all y'all had a connection with, you had a connection with Brandy. And no, I didn't know him from a can of paint. You were just helping him out. No, I was doing my job. I was doing security. You were like, doing security. <laughs> you were doing security. Chicken and waffle. So when they were pressing them, they they came and told y'all. Yeah. You know, man, these so. dudes in here up on Brandy them. We just made, bro, y'all got to leave. Man, it's our hood. We ain't going no. Oh, yeah, you going. How did you end up being security over there, though? Because I didn't want to rob banks, bro. He just applied for a job and got a job. No, Captain Shahid got me the job. <laughs> I tell you, Captain Shahid been amazing, man. Yeah, I was, I everything that. that I've ever done, I got out of prison in 1995. Uh, September 19, 1995. He put me together, took me to the Million Man March. I, I was at the Million Man. I was in D.C. Wow. I was in D.C. and I came and I vowed to God when I was in prison. If I have to change Kotex machines or baby diapers, I would not commit another crime. And I used to ride. My mother's house on Elm Street is maybe 15 miles from Pico and La Brea. You know, I'm on uh, Rose Crown and Dwight. I used to ride a beach cruiser every day to work. Mm -hmm. I was so determined. And dudes would see me and like, hey, Marv, man, hook me up with some people in Detroit. I'll give you 20000 I Oh, Marv and gave up. They laughed at me. But I was determined, man. I was broke. <laughs> I was broke. But I was determined that whatever I did, I was not going to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. Man, that's heavy. And I hear, one day I fell weak. One of my partners told me they had this inside job of this uh, insurance company, and they had fifty thousand dollars in there. And that man, all he wanted me to do was he didn't trust the other dudes. Just wanted me to go, just ride with me. And the contamination, and I'm like, all right, man, I'll be there. And when they came, it was twelve fifty prayer time. Wow. And I went outside and I looked and I said, man, hold on, I'll be right back. And I went in and did prayer. And when I come back, they was gone. Mm. I'm like, fuck. I missed out on this money. <laughs> I look bad as hell. Four o'clock, they asked was on Eyewitness News. Woo. And prayer saved me. Mm. Prayer saved you. Praying for God, prayer for you. That's real. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's real. If you do it. And you do it properly to keep you out of situations. It showed you showed your priority at that time. As much as you didn't realize that it was, it showed your priority because a lot of people would have been like, man, I'll pray when I come back. Right. But you showed your priority that you put that first over that. It had, wow. you, had, you have to. You, that was the only thing about me. Why my, I never loved anything. And I had to realize I, I love my mother. And that's what they call unconditional love. And I thought she would be our, we contaminated my mother's life so much going in and out of juvenile hall, going in and out of prison, took so much out of her life. She wasn't the same person. And I felt like I owed her. I tried every when I got out of prison, I took my mother to Hawaii, everything. I took my mother more places than I took my girlfriend. Because <laughs> they didn't come in the penitentiaries and sit up with me for hours or come and press the prison when I'm in the hole. I just want to talk to them. She was dedicated to me. And so when people, you know, you've, I, I tell people, an old man told me this in prison, love is two fools feeling sorry for each other. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So it's not about how much you love me, how much you care about me. Wow. When I look at you two, you, it's a caring. You care about his feelings, he care about yours. Love, they say love is blind. Mm -hmm. When somebody tell you, oh, if you were somebody else, I'll kill you, you got to be a fool. <laughs> wow. If you care, if you love me enough, if I'm with somebody better, you should be happy about it. Right. 
I gotta ask you about uh I seen one deal where you um seven hundred thousand that Suge Knight uh paid to start Death Row East. About seven hundred thousand. Yeah. Yeah. How, how did you cut? He wasted it. Wasted it because it never opened up. Was why? How do you? How, how do you spend that much? When you got it, you spent it. He, he had one hundred forty-seven million dollars. So he just he just wasted it. So then he spent another like four hundred thousand trying to open up in Atlanta. And you just sit back and see in these ventures. He's just trying to do these things and they're not working. Ego. Ego. Pride before destruction. Wow. To see where he's at now, man, because he, he his whole legacy is gone. The money's gone. Death Row changed, changed hands. Um, did you see, see this coming when you was a young man, when you was younger, when you was dealing with him? Because you was dealing with him at their peak. I wasn't never dealing. Shahid was dealing with him. Shahid, Shahid correct. Was my but man. you work. You work. I never with made a dime with with you. you know? <laughs> Not a penny with Death Row. <laughs> they just from Compton. Yeah, I see a lot of my homies work with him and them go. But the rise and fall, he tried to do too much for people that wouldn't do anything for him. You know, he had bad advisement. When you don't have good advisement, it it'll destroy you. Yeah, he he basically had a deal where it was a lot of people that was in fear uh, when it came down to uh, him. When it came to, I was at a, I remember I was at a, a casino one night. I don't know if they was in fear, but I do know they start whispering a lot when mm -hmm. he came in. Like, right. And I don't know what they were whispering about. They was whispering about here come down because they land to keep up a gang of confusion. So they he they bringing start, hood dudes where they shouldn't even be. Just they bring oh. Uh, blood, this and blood. No, this is a business atmosphere. When after because you was dealing with him when you were with uh, what'd you say, Hashid? Shahid. Shahid. Shahid Muhammad. Okay, Shahid Muhammad. After you were dealing with, after you had dealt with him, was there a time when because over the years he was out and walking around and doing things, and the power was gone. Yeah, I were you in still? Contact. You stayed that's in. How, that's how. Uh, see. <laughs> Uh, uh, Yosemite Sam talk about was with death. Death row was over about time he 2003. It was no death row. That's right. It was, it was just a blemish. He wasn't in death row when 96, 95 in the 90s. Correct. When it, when it was there, it was there. He was brought on by Reggie Wright. So these is Pacoima dudes. All of them is short. So I mean, Suge is damn near seven foot tall over with these little bitty guys. You know, so yeah, I, I was with him the day that he ran over Terry. The accident with you know with him and Bone and Terry, the, I was I was there, you know. And, what was that, what got, was that like though? He he just ran over Terry. No, it was an accident. Terry was trying to help him. It was it was an unfortunate accident, but everything was against you. Wow. He he had to go. White America said thumbs down on him, and he didn't have the. The acumen, he didn't have the common sense to lay low. Yeah. And, and sometimes you just got to lay low, let things just go over. Well, what, and just but bring me up to date on the story. Like when he ran over Terry, was it that, that he was trying to stop him from going somewhere? What what was it about? No, he, uh, he got into a situation with Bone, him and uh, this dude Bone, got into a situation and... Uh, Shu was in fear of his life, and he backed his car, backed his truck up. When he backed his truck up, Terry jumped out the car to help him. And when Shu seen something that shook him, he put the car in drive and came. And Terry ran, trying and slipped and fell, and went up under the car. Damn! And he ran over the top of him. He didn't never see, never saw Terry. Wow! It was never intentional. Wow. But he didn't use the advice that it should have been. He should have snitched. So he should have snitched. But he, he here he is. He really not a gang member. He's trying to keep it one hundred. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You say he's really not a gang member. No, he's not a gang member. So he wasn't a blood. He was. He was from. He was from the mob. But he's not a mob gang member. Explain that to a person who don't know. Just like brother said that he's from the neighborhood, but he ain't in the neighborhood. Yeah. He's not out of the neighborhood. Should 
grew up in, in the mob, hung out with dudes, went to Linwood High School, went to college, played football, came back, started doing security. He never was an active gang member. But did he, he used to wear red all the time, and, and he and, portrayed, oh, the, portrayed the image. Okay. And your point is, he owned death row. That was an image, huh? <laughs> Didn't you think of Shug Knight? Do you think of him as a gang member? You think uh, of him, but that's an illusion. When you think of, of Charlie, what do you think of him? So he started off as one thing. Now when he got exposed, he embraced being a snitch. Huh? First he said he ain't never told him anybody can give any paperwork on him. He'd give him $25,000. He ain't gave up the money yet, huh? So when 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 he had to when it came out he embraced it. One a brother just told me the other day that he just was on a podcast saying this year he had fifty two people arrested. Well, you know, since then he got a DWI. Huh? He got a DWI since then. One of the guys came over and told it. He fell asleep at leaving the strip club and got a DWI. Okay. So he, you know, I don't know if he's working with him or not anymore. It's still, you still working with. Him. If you turn, <laughs> do you think turning in a nigga in a DWI balance? <laughs> one one nigga take away ten DWIs. Fuck, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, so, <laughs> so you see, did you see the other day he put a gun on somebody in the interview? Somebody just told me that today. No, he did. Yeah, that's what they say. He ain't shot it though. <laughs> he didn't been pulling guns. You understand me? Uh, but he, he having a gun and shooting one is two different incidents. So, I, and I just want to, right now, we're, uh, this is... Uh, Melvin the, and Ayat, Ayatollah Marv. Ayatollah Marv. We're, mm -hmm. uh, we, we're still on um, Antoine, uh, the Antoine Doolittle. Uh, this brother been, you know... He's 57 years old, been down since he was 15 years old. Okay. Everybody got all these campaigns. Charlie said he was going to stay in prison until he got... The, uh, Michael Levy's sister in 2003 said she forgave this brother, that she had no problem, and he's still in prison. So the things that's going on, uh, we're trying to get... Uh, a fund together, uh, get together. We've, we've had some attorneys that said, it, I don't know if they're scared of Charlie or scared of white America, but they all fall. So we're trying to get together. We got 25,000. And if everybody on that get with boss talk can donate $1, uh, we can get a legitimate attorney, uh, uh, from Houston, Texas, to, to do something that's all kind of allegations. They, uh, uh, the, the man that shot uh, Ronald Reagan, he's free. This man shot the president, and six months later, he was getting home visits, but he's a white man. So we got this brother, 15 years old. His, his mind ability wasn't that of, he lived in, uh, under siege, and he wasn't thinking the same. So here, you done took this dude's life. And 42 years, he's been locked up for 42 years. Wow. And uh, all of we, we giving money to March of Dimes. All I'm asking, man, just donate $1. If you donate $1, we can get our attorney with well, enough of us. And we need to pull together. I know Texas is better than that for they all. <laughs> I know that's you right. Know? Uh, you spend a dollar, just don't smoke a blunt today. You know, <laughs> send us something and help us to uh, get a legal defense. Freedom is not free. We have to pay for freedom. So this is the uh, uh, Melvin Ayatollah Marv uh, legal, legal, uh, legal Aids. And anybody that has any uh, legal questions or legal situations, we can help. We, can, we, we do dynamic job. California, whatever you say, we are about it by it when it comes to that law. We about it. We we move. You know, I I listen to. See, I well, I, mean, I do listen to some podcasts. Okay. Oh my goodness! I just lied on myself, and I'm listening to some of these boys out of Texas that did these 25 and 30 years. 
But in all they talking about, they DP'd another brother, but they've never slain a Ku Klux Klan member or killed a guard. A dude told me the other day, he was like, man, yeah, I just did 30 years in prison. And I asked him, I said, well, how many times did you have OTC on your, on your door? He said, well, what's OTC? Out to court. So you stayed in prison 30 years and didn't do nothing. Wow. 30 years. You ain't stabbed now, white boy. You ain't checked the Mexican, but you say what you've done to a crip or a blood. I don't got all my IBs on somebody else. Man. All I did is shoe time, MCU time, OTC, out the court. I don't I don't go to prison to work. I go for punishment. If I wanted to work, I'd have been on get me a job at the Jack in the Box. Man, I tell you, man. Uh so he been locked up all really that's a long time. That's a long his whole life from 15. All he know is boys. That's all he know. You know? So do we want to just rob and just let this go for somebody that was Influenced in something that and did something that nobody else would do. Wow, that's that, that, you're right. I mean, uh, you I, I can't do nothing but agree with you. You know, uh, and, and we got a lot of brothers like this, but he's on our radar right now from California, and I'm just asking out for Texas to give us man that brother don't need to just be in prison just because another man comes every year and say they don't want him out. Wow. But the same person, like I said, he ain't said nothing to Jerry Jones, uh -uh. the Dallas Cowboy owner. They said we wouldn't let no niggas come in this house. He said, oh, I made a mistake and I, I, it was a bad judgment. So you think that you feel any different from blacks when you was 15 than you do at 70? That's real. That's real. Um, I was going to ask you about um, DJ Quick. You knew DJ Quick? Yeah. Um, how, how did you meet DJ Quick? Or did you know him since he was... How, how do you know him? He's from Treetops. He's from Compton. Okay. I know everybody in Compton. Everybody? Every, that's anybody. So What's the population in Compton? The population is uh, 197,000. And you know 197,000 people? I don't count Mexicans. How many how many black people are in in Compton? About I think about Let me see probably 76,000. And you know all 76,000. All 76. I just want, I, I mean, cause I, I gotta ask you this. And I, you you may he might have told me or he might have not have told me, but just like Coming up, you from Compton. Um, when you first come up, how do you? How does the blood? How does the the pyrus? I ain't gonna say the blood. The pyrus. How does that start? It it started. Uh, I was in prison when actually we Compton is a different place. Okay. The, the ten square miles. We're all we're all together different than L. A. or Long Beach, and it's just. Us against everybody. Okay. And um, Piru started defending themselves from uh, outsiders coming in. The Crips were coming in, taking over neighborhoods. And and uh, seven brothers stood up like, no, nah, you ain't coming. Piru Street is one of the, they have more boys on their street than like any neighborhood. That street is just from Compton, all of this. The, uh, you had the uh, the Bowen family, Mickey Blue. He was the he's kind of like the Godfather in my eye. Uh, okay. He was a bank robber back in the '60s. And okay, those were the original Pyro boys. Um, Mickey Bowen, Lonnie Hall, Clarence Grandy, and Victor Murphy. You know. And you were in prison. No, no, this is the 60s. Okay, this was the 60s, yeah, okay. That's a, this, these are the dudes I come up You under. came up under, yeah, okay. Those were, they was real bank robbers. Okay. They, they, they was real. They was real. And like, they lived on Pyro Street? They stayed on Pyro okay, Street. Okay, I they, got you. I stayed on Elm Street. We used to come over and play football against them. Okay. Now, my neighborhood was treetops at that time. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And our neighborhood would come play the Pyro boys because they, they street, they had 
They had um, the Nelson family, the Leonard family, um, Puddin's family. Puddin's, well, it was before Puddin had moved over there, though. The Johnsons, and they had a whole football team on their street, you know. So we used to come and play with them. And one day, I was 63, Mickey Blue, the first time I'd seen him. And this is uh, Terry Bourne. This is his older brother. Okay. Terry Bourne. Um, and we we playing. Stu come up in a brand new Cadillac. Man, that's Mickey Blue. He jumps out the car with a shark skin suit on, got his hair in a Marcel, long toe shoes, and he go up in the house. He comes out. We looking. Comes out of the house. When he comes out of the house, he comes out. He says, hey, y'all come here. And he got a big old bag about, and he dumps a whole. You know what a bow dollar is? Yeah, a yeah, big, yeah. He bumped out a gang of silver dollars, mm. and we y'all get him, and we put money money in our pockets, right? Yeah. And he opens the trunk of a Cadillac. You know, the Cadillac got a big old trunk. He opens the trunk of a Cadillac, and he got a suitcase, big old suitcase, and he opens it up, and it's all hundred dollar bills in there. Man, little faces. Yeah, little face. You know what I'm saying? And we, Miss Boy, Mickey, you stop giving all them kids that money. Y'all let like them boys long. And I said, I want to be just like him when I grow up. Man. I want to be like him. So it is Harold, Terry, Terry Bowen, him, and uh, Jerry Nelson. They knocked off the first armored car truck in California in 1968 and got $180,000. It was one of the biggest licks ever at that time. Wow. Then his brother Dennis, they robbed Capital Bank. <laughs> they, the boys was bank robbers. <laughs> then, that's Pyrus. And then uh, it, and that's how the Pyrus and they yeah. just stuck together and so they just they just they got it closed tight and when the Crips came in, he wasn't having it. This is Pyru Street. It's don't be done. We don't so play that game. So they start calling Pyrus, call them roosters. Roosters are red. Okay. Assignment the roosters, and next day was bloods, and bam, and now it's history. So the okay, so pyrus became roosters, and then they start calling everything else bloods. Well, the bloods started five nine brands was the first blood set. Okay, five. Oh, so pyru came before bloods, huh? Pyru came first. No, no, no. In gang banging, mm -hmm. bloods in L.A. Crips, then bloods, then pyrus. Oh, okay. Yeah. Man, that's wild. But it started a long time ago. We've been gang banging ever since. But what made, and, and the red, the red come from the roots. That's what made y'all wear red. Right. Because it didn't affiliate with the bloods right, right. off. It was just the red Ro from the roosters. Roosters, right? Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's hard. That's a history. I'm just, I'm going down through there. Mm -hmm. So you come home. So you automatically won. You, you automatically won when you come home. Uh, I get home in 1976, and uh, I got. Uh, when I was in prison, all of my homies, my older homies, were BGF, Black Gorilla Family. Okay. So when I get to San Quentin, I fall in line. You know what I'm saying? But I found is the contamination of uh, politics instead of, I believed in a revolution that would never have you. I was an old man named Death Row Jeff told me, man, I don't know why you in here killing your mama comes see you every month. Mm. He's saying that the things, he say, ain't but two things they fighting for in this penitentiary. Drugs and homosexuals. You don't mess with drugs and you don't mess with Sagundis. Why are you killing? Mm. And I thought about it. He's old man. Mr. Jefferson, if you ever look at the Patty Hearst story, you'll hear him say, if it's, it's one man that you can go to, and if you ever want to see your daughter again, he's the man. And it, Death Row Jeff, they say if Mr. Jefferson say he's going to kill you, just throw dirt over yourself. He's out of Bakersfield. <laughs> out of Cottonwood Road, said 1942. He was, in, he, he was on his way to Hollywood. Wow. One, 18 years old on his way to Hollywood, and he killed some migrant farmers. And he went to prison, and he never, in, he never made it to Hollywood. Never made it. And he said they never. They thought he wouldn't kill. He he kill he, here. He stabbed this dude named uh, Sheik Thomas, and Sheik went and told on him. And and they and they and when he went to the warden's office, 
promising Paul Nelson, and Paul asked him why he, why he stabbed Sheik, and he jumped over the table and stabbed the stabbed the uh, warden. warden with a number two pencil. Wow. He went, that's a death row Jeff. So he was on death row three times. Mm -hmm. He was, oh, he gave me, he's one of the perpetrators that got me out of prison. You wow. Know, like this, this picture, of this guy right here, this is Rochelle McGee. He's, he's the only, I think he's probably the only A number in prison right now. Wow. When George Jackson's brother, Jonathan Jackson, you ever, you ever heard of Jonathan Jackson? Mm -hmm. Uh, Jonathan Jackson was George, him and Angela Davis were in, in a courthouse in Marin County. And Jonathan was 17 years old, and he tried to free his brother. But George didn't come to court that day. And he pulled a gun on the judge. They killed the judge, shot the prosecutor. Killed, in court? Uh, no, they took him in a Jeep. And okay. it was over 2,000 bullets shot. And they shot Rochelle McGee 33 times. Shot him 33 times, and they thought he was dead. And the paramedics came and find, and they zip locked him like he was dead and took him to the hospital. Cause if we tell them they're they're these guards are gonna kill him, and he's been in adjustment center in the hole since 1966. Wow. This was Rochelle McGee. Man. When they did the boat right in 1975. And they gave everybody determinate sins. And the Board of Prison Terms in California say two men will never let in a prison population is Hugo Purnell and Rochelle McGee. You know? Wow. And Hugo got killed about two years ago. And uh, Rochelle is still about 86 years old. Got busted in 1962. Mm. I got to go back on something. I just pulled. You... Some things you hear and you see and you be like, is this really true? Did Bobby Brown really try to throw Usher off of a balcony? Yeah, not you don't <laughs> not throw him off this. You I what I just said. Yeah, I, I broke my I got my yeah. finger broken. Uh, Usher came and we was up on this balcony. I was I was uh, doing security for for Bobby at the time, and we we was in this club and we was up on this uh, up on this balcony. Usher was performing, so Usher came in all enthusiastic and just he grabbed Bob and like, man, I man, I idolize you, bro, and I woo the woo. But and he grabbed Bobby around the neck and was like choking him. Right? And Bobby picked him up. Picked him up and tried to push him over the balcony. We grabbed him. Uh uh, Usher's bodyguard grabbed Bob. I grabbed the bodyguard. When I grabbed the bodyguard, my pinky finger goes in his lapel. Captain Shahid then grabbed, and this dude is dragging me and broke my finger. That's why this ring won't come off. Oh, you mm. see, he broke it. Yeah, he broke my finger. So, you could have cut that ring off. Huh? You could have cut that ring off if you Why would I to. cut it off? This is a nation. This is why, why, why would I do that? So, but that's that basically, so, and that was, they, they know each other? That was their first time meeting? That was their first time. It was his first time. I, I, Bobby didn't know, and Bobby, you know, I guess, and dude was just energetic. Bobby was in another kind of mood. And he's like, man, this dude was just choking me. He was all in, and Bob just picked him up and like, what the hell is you doing? Like, nigga, and this dude's still holding on. I'm like, man, let this dude go. And we was like grabbing and this and this and that. That's and crazy. just got the squabbling and got my finger caught, broke my finger. Man, I was so Where mad. Where was this at? In, L in L.A.? In, L in Hollywood. In Hollywood. At a club in Hollywood. Yeah. Did wow. they ever sort it out and actually Bobby and Usher talked after that? Huh? Pretty sure did, did Bobby and Usher ever talk about it after that? I, I don't, not that I know of. Hmm. Not while I was on detail, what he, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah. That's crazy. What about, what about Nick Cannon? Did he really want to be a Pyro or that just cap? Man, you uh, know what I say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Terry Carter, the one that, that, uh, that Suge ran over, right? Sh Terry called me and Nob one day and like, man, look, uh, uh, my people down here with Nick. Nick's out of San Diego. Yeah. Uh, Skyline Pyros and this and that. And said uh, he want to be put on. Man, I want y'all to come. And I'm like, 
he put on. I said, what the hell? I said, man, I, I'm not, I can't understand a millionaire wanting to get, uh, to be a, a gangbanger. That's reverse psychology. Mm -hmm. You understand me? Like I say, when I got out of prison, I got with, like I say, BGF was selling heroin and doing different that was against my, my order. Like, it ain't what I'm, I'm built for. It just wasn't my lane. Mm -hmm. And when I start dealing with these dudes, they were selling angel dust. And it's like, man, this, this here is my product. I could deal with this. You know what I'm saying? So I got into it on an economical. Mm -hmm. This is what Fruit Town was doing. Cherry Street was the, I made my first $100,000 on Cherry Street. I, like I say, I grew up on Elm, and all our streets are named after trees. So I was a treetop since 1959. Mm -hmm. When I come home, my brother damn it changed it to Cedar Block. They went Cedar Block is a dead end street. I don't deal with dead end streets or alleys. I deal with a town, a universe, or a side. So I started associating with Fruit Town because that's where I was selling drugs at. We did everything in front of Granny House, Gay Gay, and 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 um, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, they called him Big Now Little. Um, I came to rest in peace, but yeah, that was that was the premier street, and people all over the United States would come to um, Cherry Street to buy PCP, and I sit up one day and I was like, damn, but I because if I go to Inglewood to pick up some drugs, you got to give me a deal, mm -hmm. because police for me to get back to Compton, my life in jeopardy, so if a guy comes to California and buy some PCP. We sell it, at that time we were selling it $10,000, $15,000, $10,000, $8,000 if he was a homie. Mm -hmm. Dudes was coming out of state from Texas, from uh, New York, paying $15,000 a gallon, buying it five and six gallons. I'm like, dang, if they buying it like that, you gotta double your money. Uh -huh. So let me find out how they, was, how they doing it. So my first stop was Houston, Texas. You understand me? Yale and Tidwell, Yale, Yale Apartments, Lions and Farmer, Fifth War, Scott and Cullen, Third War, keeping the crime rate up. Find out they was going 25000 a gallon here, $30,000 a gallon in New York, $45,000 a gallon in D.C. Mm -hmm. So why should I sell? And I just posted up in Houston and just made my money. Wow. I think... I think the thing I, I say about you, man, every time you, you, it's just like I told a boy earlier, you know, the, the guy that was here, you know, it's like certain ones you can't just interview one time, man. That's, and, and, and you just basically got, I know already there's so many stories. You we can't get them all. Stories. I'll be trying to get them all. Like, I, I but I'm coming, I'm coming to LA too. It's though. going to take, it probably take a whole month to get something out of you. Get well, everything. no, he's going to keep everything. thinking of stuff. He's going to keep thinking of stuff to happen. Yeah, I got it. My it, mother told me in seven, now you need to write a book. And I just <laughs> want to tell on myself. I still got too many things that's unanswered. Man, so did you ever know, uh, uh, did you ever meet Tookie Williams when he was living? Yeah, yeah. Uh, me, uh, I was in seven. I'll tell you, man, I was, I, I've been, I was locked up with some of the most violent criminals in California history. Um, How was it being locked up? You were locked up with Tookie, right? And we was in 1750 in the county jail two years together. We went to San Quentin together when they gave him the death penalty. We went to the same court in Torrance Court. Angela Bono, the hillside strangler, mm -hmm. uh, had multiple white murders. The uh, Skid Row slasher, Bobby Joe Maxwell, killed 33 people. Uh, 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 like I say, uh, Doc Holliday, the leader of the BGF, you know, um, Jan Brewer, Kevin Goff, Steven Sweater, um, uh, Kabikovich, the Alphabet Bomber. Uh, I was on a daily with them every day. So took you, so how was Tookie Williams? Did y'all talk or did y'all wasn't yeah, there? I mean, I, let me show you what happened. Tookie learned how to draw in 1750. He didn't even know he had this talent. Wow. This white boy, David Johnson, taught him how to draw. And he sat back in cell 24 and with nothing else to do. One day, we were uh, we're going to to the roof. We were going to the roof, and uh, the guards came and, and to get us. 
to the uh, take us to the roof, and it was some usually the 1750. They got a regular police on there, so these other sheriffs came down, and so this one little Mexican police he uh, like had an edge for for Turkey, right? So uh, he like uh, Williams get in line. Turkey had a a a towel around his neck, you know, so when he go work out upstairs. So the the police tell him like uh uh Williams, take that towel from around your neck. So he said, Man, I'm using it when I go upstairs. He said, Man, I said take so Tookie take the towel off and throw it on the floor. So the police tell him, Man, pick it up. I said, Take it off with took like, man, what he said, Man, no, you ain't going to the yard, take it down. So I said, Take it down. So I said, if he take it down, we all taking it mm. down. So I'm like, what? I said, man, we locking up. Ain't nobody taking it down. We ain't going to the yard. So Dr. M said, okay, so we are 24 of us. We all going back. Police pull and push me to the side. Push me to the side, lock everybody down. Tell me to cut my fingernails. I said, man, I'll cut them when I get. He said, no, cut them now. The same little Mexican, right? He said, cut them now. So I'm like, no. Nah. So now they got me handcuffed from behind. So he said, well, you ain't going to cut him. So he said, I'll cut him for you. I said, but no, man, look. Okay, I understand what you're saying, sir. I'll cut him. He unhandcuffed one handcuff. I elbowed him, cracked him, right? Got the Ray Ray Bryan and grabbed him on the leg from his cell and took him to the ground. And the police, they broke two of my ribs. <laughs> but that, that was my my shot with Tookie at the time. Mm-hmm. Wow, man. That's crazy, man, because at the end of the day, you wouldn't, you wouldn't know that. Well, I guess you could because you guys go back so far and being in the, uh, in the, in the system, you know, being in a county or going to San Quentin, you had to run into each other, you know, doing time, you know. Yeah, we did some, we did some time in, in the, the 1991, uh, gang truce, uh, took, he was on death row and he was, uh, they had him via, uh, telecast and he like, man, Marvin kids are there. So he said, man, more. He said, man, I, he said, man, this shit then went crazy, bro. He said, you know what? I never thought, I would never imagine my in my mind, Pyru was even fighting. It wasn't enough of us to fight each other at a time in jail. And for us to kill each other? He said, man, if I had a known Crippen would have turned out like this, when I started, he said, man, I would have killed myself. I never intended for this to happen. Wow, so he never wanted to see Crippen go the way that it went. Man, I mean, when you're a part of something and it go bad and you sitting there and you looking at mass murder under a banner that you prolicified, that you pushed hard, and people taking it out your name and they doing something else with it, that's heartbreaking. Yeah, because it wasn't never meant. It, it you never wasn't meant for that. You never never me- Man, we had pyro love. I look at this dude. It's so sad. Dude, tell me he going a pyro put a contract on another pyro, and dudes is like allowing it. They ain't gonna kill me, but they might. That's why I've been laying low <laughs> for money. <laughs> dude, else, lay, yeah, money a cut change a lot of minds. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So when a nigga tell you I'm gonna show you what this bag gonna do. So I got to be, I'm no fool, no siree. I'm going to live to be 103. I'll play safe for you and me. I'm no fool. I got to ask you one more thing before I get you out. I'm going to get you out of here. Um, so you told me that Suge Knight wasn't a member of a gang, but you seen Tupac as well with him. So they would say M.O.B. Mm-hmm. I thought it was member of the Bloods. Money over bitches. I thought about that too. Well, that's money over bitches. M O B is not uh, mo mo our uh, bloods. Uh, mob is pyrus. Okay, so so because Tupac never did you and you met Tupac mm-hmm. and you met where did you? Where was your first time meeting Tupac at at, at uh, on on the set of Gridlock? Okay, and, and, um, did you ever meet him in the neighborhoods? Or he never was. Like, I didn't like I say I wasn't hanging out with them like that. Yeah, you sound like me when you're older. You really, I, yeah. I, that wasn't your I, cup I of tea. I was active, but I wasn't. I'm not a fan. Yeah, yeah, you in business. I've always been my own individual. I I have my own private parties. 
<laughs> I don't go along to get along. <laughs> you and you say that, and I definitely get it. So was he hard to uh, to 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 secure? No, Pac was all that when he with the mob. When he would on, it's an act. But this dude stay when he ain't on the movie set. He's in the dictionary reading. Mm -hmm. He's writing. He's reading poems. He's reading uh, 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 Cahill Cabrans. He's reading uh, uh, Che Cavera. This is what this dude is doing daily. Hey, hey, I, can you go get me this book? Can you go get me that? This is what, his life wasn't just partying and, you know, that's the persona that you see, the small part that you see. His life was bigger than that, you know? Mm -hmm. It's an act. <laughs> Yeah, I don't That's think it. Charlie act like that all the time. <laughs> no, he might. <laughs> no, he don't. Yeah, Jimmy the Cricket might. <laughs> so, uh, no, he doesn't. But at the end of the day, I just thought it would be it, it's something else. Talk because you dealt with uh, Mike Tyson as well, just securing these premises for these well, celebrities. The best detail I ever had. Mike is a genuine brother. I mean. He's a given, a good-hearted, I mean, this dude is 100% for his people. Wow. 100%. And to show you how mind over matter, when it started going bad for him, and white America filed out with Don King, and they was trying to slander out, and he got, he laid down for two years. Mm -hmm. Guys, you could hear nothing from about Mike. Went over to Italy, started doing a show in Italy, and America ain't going to let nobody outdo them. Come on back, Mike. You're a good nigga. Just stay in your place. Wow. Mike, Mike Tyson, so they, they portrayed him at first like he was unintelligent, but then now you hear, uh, especially with, with his podcast and everything, just he's brilliant. Like, yeah, you know. So they want, every box is a thug. Low mentality, low IQ. We don't go to prison just to be dumb. A lot of them do. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? They say if you want to keep something from a black, put it in a in book. book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I want, this is why the prison system start changing and they got videos and they got dudes in prison don't read anymore. Give them cell phone. That cell phone is a setup. You think you can hide something in a cell? You can find them easy. So, but everybody they, have it. Yeah, they're, they're because they're tracking your calls. Yeah. And they, oh, blood, what's happening? All oh, these calls are monitored. And when they get all the phone numbers, they have a sweep and take all the phones. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But like I said, I, I just appreciate you for coming on the show, man. Um, uh, I know already, me and you, we always talk. So thank you always for taking my call, respecting us, man, and coming down and blessing us, man, because you, you called me, you came, man. you always going to be a part of what we do mm -hmm. forever. I appreciate forever, you. Forever, you know, ever, hey, right? Without you, before Boss Talk, didn't nobody know more. <laughs> didn't give a fuck about me. I go through the street now. Man, I know. Man, I, I was my first little... I was paranoid, like, who I owe money to? People looking at me, like, man, yeah, I seen you somewhere. This, this old lady, <laughs> about a month ago, this old lady said, oh, I know you. I said, you do? Ah, uh, ain't you that boy? I said, what boy? You on that social media stuff? What you doing watching? <laughs> oh, church lady. I mean, and that's the th that's the beauty of it, though. But I think you guys, your stories, man, you got something to say that helps. It's a lot of brothers. Like I told that other guy that we was interviewing earlier. And I, what's his name again? The guy. Kevin. Kevin. Mumford. Kevin Mumford. Yeah. And just the stories when you've been through so much. You know what I mean? This can help our people. I know that. They look at your story, and they, they can relate to it. Most people, like you said, they might not read a book, but they'll show watch a YouTube. Uh -huh. That's what, hey, I didn't know it was that big. You see what I'm saying? That's right. what I knew. That's, that's my, one of, uh, my partner, Tony Hustle. I give a shout-out to Hustle. Shout-out to Tony Hustle. Big Hustle out of New Jersey. Out of New Jersey. Was Boss a, Talk 101 uh, hollering at you. Uh, Warner Brothers, that's Sexy Freaky Electric. Hey. Yeah, he's, he's, a man, he's the man. And he like. Marv, you be you a star, and I'm like, 
Man, you got four million people that looked at what I couldn't, I can't see. I don't look at myself as a big guy. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm just, you, he said, man, these dudes around here holding their nuts on you. They watching the podcast, mm, they watching bro. Them. And, and I have more Crips than Bloods come to me. Wow. Oh, gee, man, I seen your pod. I'm from the other side. And it's like, but now dudes right around me, they're not going they'll to turn it. their head. What up, more? Yeah. They, they saw. They, also, they watching they, you. They watch. They know more. They holding their nuts on you. Yeah. But I mean, that okay. It's all good. But it's just like, it's like, just tell the truth, you know. Uh, my truth. It, it ain't, to me, it ain't no such thing as my truth. It's the truth. Yeah, yeah. You understand me? My truth may be a lie. <laughs> <laughs> that's an illusion. Yeah. That's my story. Yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, we, we try to try to put it out on a real pretense, and I don't try to make myself look. Be, I survived everything I survived from from being scary. Man. And I was so scared that I'll kill everybody on the planet, so I won't be scared no more. Wow. You know it's just critical. Uh, I tell people this: it's easy to say these things like "I'll kill you." Yeah. But to do the act, to perform the act, it Here's changes your else. life. Mm -hmm. Wow. God takes something from you that you'll never get again. Wow. You do get what I'm saying? No, I get it. So, when people say that, it's so many dudes right now. Young twenty that done done that and they done, they're plumb crazy in prison because yeah. they never allowed it to and they they didn't know no better and yeah. they didn't do any better and it haunts you. Wow, it haunts you. Wow, man, so that's the only thing I pledge to do. Look at it before when, but you think you're pulling that trigger, man. It's it's. It ain't all about that. Man. Hey, man. Thank you for coming on the show. We love you. Hey, Marv, we love you, man. Man, for sure. Say, man. Shout out to me, man. Help us. Melvin at Ayat. Ayatollah Marv, gangster. Yeah, legal. And, and, and his dollar sign, gangster legal. Dollar gangster. sign. And is that on, is that on, on, that's on Cash App, right? On Cash App. Yeah. Have anybody been sending you all money? Not a dime. Dang. I, 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 just, I just brought it out to y'all. Okay. Because okay. It, we uh we had some attorneys in in Houston, these black attorneys that was gun ho for it, white America or or Charlie and scared them off. Man, it ain't nothing we can change. Money changes everything. So uh, we putting up twenty five thousand. I got an attorney saved for seventy five thousand year frame. Mm -hmm. And if each of us put up a dollar, y'all got fifty thousand people. Yeah. Y'all got one dollar. Yeah. You can spare one dollar to free somebody. Yeah. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So that that's all I'm asking, just for a little help from Texas. Yeah. You know? And 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 that's what we want to do. Because I mean, I don't care what Antoine did at fifteen. He should he still be held accountable for it at fifty seven. We don't do white America like that. So let's just start doing for each other. Like you said, this is how we change shit. Right. Now tell me the story again about this guy, Antoine Davis. A uh, Antoine Doolittle, Doolittle. Was, is, is uh, Charleston White's crime partner that Charleston White testified against in the, the uh, burglary of some uh, bomber jackets and end up a man by the name of Michael Levy end up losing his life. And first, uh, Charleston White claimed he did the, I did this and I did that. I killed a white man. And when we got the testimony, he testified against Antoine Doolittle and sent him to prison for a life sentence. So we're not saying that he didn't do what he did, but we're looking for uh, diminished compassion and an insanity that this brother wasn't even right in his mind as a young black black child to be sent to a man's prison for 42 years. 
Wow, man! Thank you for coming on the show. Hey, Appreciate man! You. Hey, hey, that, hey! Make sure you guys like and subscribe, man. But that—that's a hey. That's Ayatollah Marv, man. Uh, hey, y'all seen it again, man? We, and we, you gonna see him some more, man? Whoop, check whoop. it, check <laughs> it, man. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk One Hundred and One, where the bosses talk. And we out.